Thanks for joining us today. My name's Steve Hill. I'm the Chief Scientist at Geoscience Australia. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet, which um, for us is uh, in Canberra, but I can appreciate that uh, many of you are spread around the nation and perhaps even the world. I'd like to pay, um, on behalf of everyone, my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people participating in, in our seminar today. This is really exciting, folks. This is the first Wednesday seminar for the year. And I'm delighted to say that two of our three speakers are from the discovery and engagement team at Geoscience Australia, which is in my office of the chief scientist. And that's why I have the great pleasure in, um, in chairing this session. Let's uh, now just a brief uh, little bit of background on our speakers. Um, our first one, the first person we'll be speaking will be Shona Blewett. And Shona is the Education Manager at Geoscience Australia. And she has qualifications and experience in formal and informal education and a degree in geology. She regularly delivers virtual and in-person training and presentations to students and teachers. Our second speaker is Rachel Przlowski, and Rachel is the director of the Discovery and Engagement Program at Geoscience Australia, and uh, is a marine scientist. She is currently working to engage more Australians to understand the value and diversity of geoscience. And our third speaker, very happy to welcome into our seminar series, Kate Selway. Kate is an earth scientist specialising in the composition and structure of the crust and upper, upper mantle. She has just finished a future fellowship at Macquarie University, and I believe uh, she's about to commence uh, very soon at the University of Adelaide, working at the university uh, as part of its uh, geoscience program, but also engaged with the MINEC CRC. Um, Kate is an alum of the Superstars of STEM program and is passionate about engaging the next generation of geoscientists, which is exactly what the combined presentation today is all about, entitled Earth Science Education and Engagement Post 2020. I won't say any more, I'll leave it up to our speakers, but I do hope that this presentation will help guide the discussion on how we can most effectively ignite the interest of the next generation in pursuing geoscience. So please welcome Shona, Rachel and Kate. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Steve. You should be able to see my screen now for the first part of the presentation. The outline is here we go. So three sections, myself first of all, followed by Rachel, and then handing over to Kate for the latter part. So my brief is to talk about the education program we have here at Geoscience Australia. It has a number of aspects. We have the face-to-face -face delivery within our education centre and here at Geoscience Australia in Canberra for students, and that's our bread and butter business, but also for teachers. We have our education resources because we're a national organisation and those resources are available to everyone within the country and beyond, plus our outreach activities such as Science Week and Earth Science Week. So with our visits, we are hosting thousands of students every year, usually. And over the years, we've worked out what works with those students and what doesn't work with those students in a visit that's usually up to hour and an hour and a half long. And our usual student cohort are actually upper primary students who are coming to Canberra as part of their Canberra camp. They're coming from interstate. So it's a misconception that most of our visitors are local. They're not, they're interstate. And they're here for maybe one night, two nights, or even a whole week. So we want to engage those students and we want to make sure that they're wanting to learn what we have to give them and we want them to have experiences that are memorable. And a couple of those engaging experiences are adding a layer to our sediment columns when they arrive. We have many sediment columns now that we've been filling up since 1999 with a layer for each visit and students can also see their school visits in previous years and recognise that that links to the formation of sedimentary rocks and records of rocks in the past. 
And at the end of our visits, we make an earthquake. It doesn't matter if they come for a hazards visit or not, but we're going to make an earthquake using our on-site seismograph. And you can see students here tapping the floor, but they will be jumping up and down. And again, one of those memorable experiences that they don't forget when they walk out the door, they'll be recalling that later when they're back at school. The visits are focused on hands-on experiences as much as possible. So the centre is, is littered with, with rocks in, a, in an organised way, of course, but we want students to touch. Sometimes we actually have to remind them normally, go and touch these specimens, go and pick them up, feel the differences in density, do other interactive act things like putting the water onto the poor, porous rock. And the displays are all linked to the curriculum. So that when the teachers have these students in term four later in the year, they can go, well, do you remember when we were at Geoscience Australia, we saw this, that or the other, and they all do link back to the curriculum. And during the visits, we want to have a mixture of formal and informal time. They, the students can't sit and listen to us forever, but we have experienced staff and they do do direct address to the students and they feel, and we all feel crazy sorts of questions um, from students, particularly the upper primaries, they really do think broadly at times. But we mix it, mix it around. We change locations from the foyer shown in this picture back to the education centre, and we get students working at their own pace with activity sheets. But do you know what? If somebody spends most of the time looking at the crystals in the cabinets and doesn't write a thing, I don't mind because they were completely engaged during their visit. We're able to access behind the scenes at times and use our wonderful science staff as well. So we can do customised visits for small numbers of extension classes or senior classes or uh, summer schools like the National Youth Science Forum. So over the years, particularly thinking about our upper primary and middle secondary age group, we've worked out some of the things that do engage the students. And teaching about plate tectonics is an underpinning thing for geoscience. And we have a puzzle, you know, a physical puzzle that they can use. But I, I and the other team members wave that puzzle around and often show it from the back. And we can see here the shape of the Pacific plate from the back. And you might think, hang on, that looks a bit like Pac-Man. And yeah, the students think that as well. And we show them the Pacific plate, Pac-Man, and its relationship from the back at least to the Indo-Australian plate. And they're going, oh, you know, Pac-Man's eating Australia. Well, what a great way to get starting to talk about what's going on at plate boundaries. We're not getting eaten. One plate is sliding beneath the other. We're not changing the shapes of that corner. All those sorts of things leading into, of course, discussing geohazards and that sort of thing. But you can see in the pictures that kids just love putting the puzzle together for themselves, working it out. The revelation on their faces when they realise it's a continuous puzzle and you can take a piece from one side and put it on the other because it's not fixed by a rigid sort of um, square outline. Something else that's eternally engaging is microscopes and magnification. We have digital microscopes, but the binocular microscopes where students have their own individual experience are always popular. And in this case, the ones on the left, they're looking down at sand under the microscope and just seeing the, the, the amazing variety of grains that they can see there. On the top right, we have a, a new piece of amber in there with a nice big sort of termite insect in there that they can see. So and hand lenses, the traditional co thing that geologists will do when looking at rocks, you know, all of those sorts of magnifications engage students. Quite a few years ago now, we started being asked, you know, do you have a piece of obsidian when um, primary students were coming in and going, well, why do you want to know? And they were playing Minecraft. And the computer game Minecraft has remained eternally popular. Um, many years down the track, we still got students who play this. We, we ask them how many know about it and played the game. And it, it's very, very popular. It's being used in schools as, net, as well in, as an education resource. But we have a couple of posters that link into that. And we have a display in the foyer that links into Minecraft. Movies are helpful, or oh, help, oh, depends. San Andreas, movies like that, big disaster movies where, you know, you're actually trying to say, well, that disaster movie was almost more over the top than reality, but you're linking back to understanding earthquakes and tsunamis and what really might happen there. So these tactile experiences, the two scale experiences, such as an image of a Live, uh, diprotodon to scale on our windows that students can stand next to. These are all our normal um, situation within the education centre. And I'll just mention the resources that we have. So going away from our on-site experiences to what we have for the whole country and 
Now, teachers will see these as well when they visit us, but they're all available online. Some of them are in print, such as the timescale bookmark and the grain analysis cards, and we can send these out to um, schools and even universities around the country. We have posters, a few in print, but they're all online as well, suiting different age groups and experiences. We have cut out activities, and I haven't shown the images of the fossil ones, which are much trickier than you might realize. We've got some ready-made PowerPoints. We've got a long-standing series of comprehensive booklets of information for teachers that have been written by uh, largely our science staff, but they also include student activities. And all of this is delivered through our website. So things changed last year. What I've described was, what was the norm. Uh, late March, end of March last year, we closed and had no more face-to-face -face experiences whatsoever. We went from hosting 12,000 or so students in the year, up knocking on 13, you know, 300 or more visits in the year to 41 last year in the first term and a handful of local schools in the fourth term. So we had to pivot as um, that term has been used in many, many ways. So our pivot was in many ways, a great opportunity as well. We had the time to do a lot more product pr production, you know, preparation production. Um, we had new student activities for um, coming out. We had activities for teachers. We did these ready-made, ready-to-use PowerPoints. We added, well, we did something new as well. We um, took a couple of the science talks about hazards and provided crib sheets for teachers because we recognise that most teachers won't have time to literally preview a whole 50-minute talk about a topic. So we tried to support them in that way. We did more newsletters to help people, teachers in particular, to know about what we were doing. Our web pages were improved. We did some online sessions for schools. But that was tricky for us. We're a hands-on centre, so how do we manage that? Um, we found that if the teachers at the other end were able to have some hands on as well, that was really helpful. And for some local schools, we could actually lend them a rock box. And these images are of a, and some local year fours who had a box of rocks in their classroom. And we're waving around the rocks as well. And they can actually relate to those things together, put the, put the two experiences together. We did some online professional learning for teachers. And perhaps what I'm most proud of and most pleased with is the series of short videos that we made. When we couldn't have students come to see us, we thought, well, how can we provide information, but also provide a, a mini experience of what would happen if they were here? So that's what we started doing. The first one was an introduction to plate tectonics, which was using our globe and using the plates bubble and introducing the things that we would normally say face to face. But it works in the classroom and now it's available for everybody all of the time. And then the series grew and grew with um, shaking um, sugar cubes around, showing teachers how they can do that as an activity with students, to also talking with scientists within our videos about the earthquake centre and fo how fossils are formed. So that's something that, that, that's a summary of what happened to us last year. Just before I hand over to um, the next speaker, the situation now is that we are open. The education centre is open. We have a full um, set of bookings in the calendar. We've got We've already had some interstate visits come through, but we're also in probably the most dynamic situation I've ever seen in 15 years here, where everyday bookings are changing. Schools are looking for a backup booking or they're moving, or canceling a booking or they're looking, they're still booking for next year as well and beyond. But it's a very dynamic situation. Um, but hopefully we will be able to um, carry on in a fairly close to normal way this year. All right, that I will stop sharing and hand over to Rach if I can get my mouse there. Here we go. There we go, Rachel. Thanks, Shona. Now I'm going to attempt, I can't see anything anymore, but I just assume it looks good and that the moderator, Robert, will interject if it doesn't. Um, so I'm going to step back a bit from the GA Education Center. I'm going to talk more about some broader national challenges with Australia education and outreach in the earth sciences. And I'm going to do this by doing a list because everybody loves a list. So I've got five slides after this, and I'm just going to go through five key challenges or opportunities if you're feeling a little bit glasses half full today. So our first challenge in engaging and educating Australia in the earth sciences is to build teacher confidence and opportunity. So we can do this in three ways. We can develop engaging content for professional development. Shauna talked a bit about how GA does this, um, but that's not enough. Um, we need to make that interesting and curriculum-based, 
because believe it or not, there actually are some teachers that don't have an intrinsic interest in earth sciences. I know that's probably a bit blasphemous for this audience. Um, and so we not only need to make it related to the curriculum, but we need to find that hook for some of those teachers that might not normally have that inherent interest or confidence in the subject matter. We also need to promote it. It's not enough to do it. We've got to let teachers know about it. Um, and so we can do this in multiple channels because like the rest of us, not everybody's on Facebook, particularly not anymore. Not everybody reads newsletters or checks emails or looks in these certain professional networks. And so we want to do a multi-channel approach with the promotion. And then finally, we need to make it easy for teachers to attend and participate. Teachers are extraordinarily busy. Um, they don't necessarily want to use their off hours for even more um, teaching resources. And so we, we need to make it easy um, and logistically possible for them to participate and attend these sessions. The second challenge is that we need to consider diversity and inclusion. And so what I mean here is how do we best connect with those that might not normally have the opportunities to participate? So Shona talked a lot about in-person visits to the GA Education Center, but she also talked a lot about some of our virtual engagement. Not every school group can or is willing, particularly now, to come to Canberra to visit. Um, they can't come to our center. Um, remote schools, schools that are in a low socioeconomic bracket, how do we connect with them? And so we found from last year that digital experiences certainly have the broadest reach, with very few exceptions, um, some that don't have you know, appropriate internet access or, or that kind of space. We can actually reach a much broader school, um, school group with digital. But there's this new thing, which I actually quite like my this, this word, it's the favorite one from 2020, digital fatigue. And you can see this poor little fella here suffering from that during one of our virtual classrooms. Um, spending all day in front of a computer doing this kind of stuff is not easy. And it does make it really hard to learn and to pay attention and to really get engaged. And Shona talked about um, the rock kits that we give to some of these classes so that we have they have something tangible and tactile to look at at the same time that we're engaging with them digitally. And that hybrid approach seems to work quite well. So I just wanted to point out that we need to temper that inclusivity with engaging activities. It's not enough just to try and expand our reach as much as possible. We also want to have that be meaningful. And then finally, I wanted to touch on tailoring approaches to specific communities and interests. So you see I've got two little pictures here of two exceptional programs um, that are more for general STEM. So Questacon actually has um, a science and first language video series, which is where they've gone to remote and indigenous schools. And they've actually had the kids talk in their language, um, it, it, explaining some scientific concepts and doing some really fun kind of, you know, the normal cliche kids experiments. And you can see here by this photo, the kids have a genuine enjoyment for it. It gives them a sense of ownership over it. And it also showcases, I guess, this incredible diversity of, of students that we have in Australia. Um, and then finally, Deadly Science is another program that does general STEM as well. And they started out just by um, facilitating donations of current science books to some of these remote and indigenous schools. And they've ex since expanded out quite a lot um, to, to broader STEM programs. Third challenge is that we need to communicate our value. So how do we connect with students and teachers, like I mentioned before, who might not normally find earth sciences interesting? The first and I guess most traditional way that we often fall back on in the geosciences is explaining the economic benefit to people. So how much did it contribute to our economy? This is probably the most straightforward, easy, and, and arguably the most impactful um, aspect of our sciences. However, particularly with the next generation, this can actually be a turnoff. So when you talk to things about mining, they have a huge focus on environmental sustainability, and that's very important to many of us, including the next generation. Kate will talk more about that after me. And so we can actually use that. We can relate geosciences and the earth sciences to environmental sustainability. We have these wonderful earth observation programs now that can give you a sense of agricultural monitoring, um, monitoring over time for various environmental impacts, um, bushfire management. And so there's all these really great elements that can be, um, can be linked to environmental sustainability now. Linking to other subjects, geoscience is quite a broad discipline. It's not one of those core disciplines like biology and chemistry and physics. Um, and it links to all of those. And so by using those links and actually really accepting them and recognizing them and valuing them, we can communicate value to people who might be interested more in those other different dis disciplines. 
And then finally, we want to keep it relevant, exciting, and modern. The space program is a, a great way of doing this. It links a lot of modern um, technology related to geosciences, positioning, satellite observations, and all of that's a huge hook, particularly for the next generation now. On that note, we need to keep up with the times to keep things engaging for people. We have found that bringing it back to individual experiences works well. Almost every student these days, whether the parents want them to or not, has a mobile phone when they're a teenager. This is a great way of engaging them. So how does your mobile phone know where you are? How does the GPS work? How does positioning work? And that can be a hook into some of the more modern geoscience aspects. Adopting new engagement tools is, is very important. So here you can see Claire and um, doing, I think, our first Facebook live stream. I do believe this was our first one. And so this actually allowed us to connect in an audience with the audience in a way we hadn't done previously. Um, and there's heaps of new engagement tools out there, some good, maybe some not so good, but you know, you give it a try, see what works. And you'll always connect with some different part of the audience. We wanna include the full spectrum of earth sciences, like I mentioned before. And at the end of the day, for many of us, the reason we're engaged with STEM is because we love observations, we love field work, we love doing experiments, and we don't want to lose this. Um, so that's still a great hook for um, students and teachers and the general public. And I, I think that's important to keep that aspect in most of our engagement activities. Finally, and we, this goes with my previous point about diversity and inclusion, we want to showcase diverse role models. So the more different types of people we have in these various ge geoscience roles, so that can be scientists, an educator, a technician, a programmer, but the more different types of people we have, the more types of students and the next generation that you will see, they'll be able to identify themselves in those roles. And then the final challenge is that we need to connect the dots. Now I'm about to show what I thought in my head was gonna be a wonderful graph, but it didn't turn out the way I wanted. Um, what I'm trying to say here is that we, we have a lot of different um, engagement and education programs that are operating at various levels, local, state, and national level, that are looking at general STEM engagement or more focused discipline engagement, like in the geosciences. And we do have so many of them. And right now, there's not a huge link between a lot of them. Um, we want to make sure that we're complementing our education and engagement experiences and not overlapping them, um, just for efficiency's sake and to, to best make clear messages to the public. Um, I, I need to point out that this graph here is just from my experience. This is not comprehensive. It's from a, I guess the local is more from an ACT experience where, where I'm based. And um, the state and national are more from our core stakeholders that, that we have at the GA education program. So don't, don't feel offended if you don't see your, your favorite education or outreach program here. It wasn't a deliberate omission. We need to cross promote. So we've got all these different programs and organizations and individuals really passionate in this space. And instead of competing, we actually need to be promoting each other's activities. And again, looking for those efficiencies and links and then sharing our learning. So not everything is gonna work. Not everything is gonna work with the same people. And so learning from each other, again, is just increasing that efficiency. So this is just a conclusion from Shona's in my talk, um, and just wanted to point out that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach for engagement and education in our sciences. I think that's obvious, um, and we need to really be able to tailor that approach, but also balance that with the limited resources that we might have to deliver. So it is a balancing act between quality, quantity, and available resources. And I would argue that we're now getting to the stage where Australia is probably ready to develop a national geoscience education and engagement strategy. But how do we start? So on that note, I will pass over to Kate, who might give us some more ideas. Okay, then I'll, um, I'll get involved with some questions. Luckily, we've got a few that are up um, on the chat already. So um, we've got one from, uh, Dave Annette's here. Uh, firstly, David says, very impressive facility and program from Geoscience Australia. He's curious about follow-up. After the initial positive engagement, what efforts are made to check engagement through secondary education or even beyond, if I can add that in? That might be a question for Shona or Rachel. I suspect we don't have a perfect good answer to that. Um, I sort of emphasise we have a lot of primary students coming through, but we also have some secondary as well. Um, but we don't 
track them long term. We certainly get feedback from the visits themselves. And I think we know that it's not necessarily any one experience that will switch a student onto a particular subject area, such as earth science. And that what we hope is that, for example, if they leave us and they have a great experience with us, that through their secondary years in particular, that their teaching is engaging in earth science. And I think this is our ongoing challenge is to get to the teachers that are not interested at the moment because they are the ones that are potentially undermining that interest because they leave the earth science unit in year eight or year nine. It's in the curriculum, but they leave it to the last minute. They don't bring enthusiasm to it. They do it because they have to. And unfortunately, those teachers are not the ones that volunteer to come to our sessions either. So it's an ongoing challenge, but I think it is a suite of experiences rather than any one thing that might be tipping points for, for students. So um, yeah, that's an ongoing thing. I would point out um, Questacon actually has a very good monitoring and evaluation program that we're just in the embryonic stages of tapping into, and that might have some use, utility for us to, to measure the impacts of our, our education and outreach program long term, because it is quite tricky. Um, any scientist will tell you measuring impacts is difficult to begin with, and it doesn't, it applies as well to education and communication and outreach space. Excellent. I see that Kate's rejoined us. She might be just politely waiting for a gap. Yes, here she is. <laughs> Try this again. Sorry, everyone. Okay, you seeing the first slide there? Yep. Yep. And the second slide? Mm, yes, yeah, I can see the second slide. Fantastic. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, so. Um, so some students might be put off um, geoscience degrees because they think they're environmentally unfriendly. Conversely, um, there's an argument that we see an uptick in geoscience enrollment numbers at times of mining booms. Um, so, so then that would suggest that students are actually wanting those mining jobs. Parents might think that careers in minerals and energy are unstable. They see a lot of layoffs quite often or just the student perception of earth sciences in general. It's old men with beards, or maybe that they're blood subjects at school or unprestigious. So we have a poll um, that I think we'll see if this one, if this works. Um, just with a few of those options, I'm interested to see what you as the audience today think are the main reasons um, why those students um, are not currently um, enrolling in earth sciences. Um, I'm just going to keep it. I'm not sure how that poll works. So hopefully that's popped up for you um, and, and just answer that um, as, as works for you. So we have a lot of theories. Um, and I think in a lot of, um, as I speak to people, a lot of what we do comes from these ideas. Um, you know, people have their theory that they like the best. And so then they, they work on programs to try to combat that theory. Um, but I feel like we can be, you know, Although we're all scientists, we can be a little bit unscientific about that. Really, these are all just hypotheses. Um, and if we're being scientific about it, we want to assess um, which of these hypotheses are actually supported by the data, run some experiments on them um, before we kind of put all of our efforts into, um, in a, into addressing that problem. Um, and so I'm going to talk through, I don't think that we have currently the data in Australia on why students are not um, taking up geosciences, and that's kind of the main thing that I want to um, encourage us to do. But I'm going to show you a few things that we do have that, that maybe give us some beginnings of ideas. So this firstly, this is from a survey of Australian teenagers from an organisation called REACH. This survey has been going for, I think, 19 years, um, and it's a relatively small group, 600 students, um, but they do quite detailed um, surveys and, and interviews with these students. This is just a word cloud, um, and the question for the students was, my personal dream for my future is, and this is just a word cloud of their responses. And I think the main thing from this is that there's a huge variety of things that young people want from, for, from their futures, which is maybe understandable because um, you know, they're, they're as diverse a group as anybody else is. We can drill down a little more deeply into that survey. Um, 
So these were some statements that the students were asked to rank between not agreeing with them at all at zero and agreeing with them strongly at 10. So I've just pulled out some of the themes in this. So firstly, the environment. There was a statement in Australia, we're consuming too much and threatening our environment. And that's kind of ranked at a 6.6, .6, um, not terribly high actually. Um, and a statement, I feel that nothing is being done about the environment, which is ranked uh, lower at a, at a 5.7 and kind of a plot of those uh, results there. Suggesting that students care about the environment, but it's actually not one of their most pressing um, issues. Questions about the, the jobs that they're looking for and the salaries of those jobs. Um, so the questions were, the statements were that money is important, but it's more important to me that I love my job. And that got an 8.1. And then everything expensive, I want a comfortable lifestyle. If I want a comfortable lifestyle, I'll have to work hard. Got a 7.7. Um, and then down the list in my career, money is most important to me as it will give me freedom. Got a 5.2. So again, a mix. So students maybe are not purely interested in just a job that's going to make them loads and loads of money, but they they still want a comfortable lifestyle. They they recognise that that they need a job, that they need a stable job that's going to give them enough money to have a comfortable lifestyle. Um, and it's some interesting um, gender differences here as well. Certainly in this question um, that money is important, but it's more important to me that I love my job. Um, a much higher proportion of women agreed with that statement than men. So so the, these young men were perhaps more interested just in having a really high paying career and the women were more interested in, um, in having a job that they loved. Some of their other priorities, um, some of these really highly ranked um, items where I think it's important to want to make a difference and achieve it, they've got an 8.1. Um, and I think it's important for young Australians to travel and experience different cultures also got an 8.1. So for these students, at least, um, I think interesting that like, maybe the environment as a specific topic didn't actually rank as highly as I would have expected, but they still do want to get out there and make a difference in the world. Um, and they want to travel and experience different cultures, which is obviously something that the earth sciences um, do allow them to do. Another survey, this is from Mission Australia. Um, this is another survey that's been running for decades. And it's kind of differently run here. They have, I think, almost 26,000 respondents, but it's more just um, just a sort of a numerical survey from those people. And some really interesting findings in this. So here um, on the left, we just have a list of the issues of highest personal concerns to these young people who are aged 15 to 19. Um, this is from 2020. The top three were coping with stress, mental health and body image. And a really interesting result from this, that in 2008, the environment was the top personal concern of these young Australians. Um, and it started dropping a little bit, um, but now actually the environment is rated so low on this that it doesn't even make the list. Um, so that in itself, I think is um, it's a really it's interesting and, and maybe a bit shocking and maybe says also something about the messages that we need to be giving to young people that um, that they actually ought to be more concerned about the environment than they are, perhaps. But when these same people were asked about the most important issues in Australia, um, then the environment did actually rank here as the fourth most important issue in Australia. So interesting, they think it's important, but it's not um, seen by them as an issue of personal importance. Moving on to geoscience. So we have in geoscience this fantastic um, a data set put together by Dave Cohen at the Australian Geoscience Council of geoscience enrolments from 2003 to 2017. And so we see a very strong um, increasing trend from 2003 up to a peak in 2012-2013. And since then there's been quite a strong decrease in not only geoscience enrolments here in first year in the green, but also in retention of those students into second and third year um, and honours. Um, and it's also been pointed out that um, these trends, there's, they're correlated with a lag um, between the expenditure in mineral exploration and, um, and 
to an extent in petroleum exploration as well. So this um, has been the basis for some of these arguments that uh, student numbers trend with, um, with mining booms um, and, and essentially that when we have the next boom, we should expect um, large numbers of enrolments as well. But we can look into this a little bit more as well. So this is just for geoscience, but then we also have data for um, enrolment in all sorts of different fields from um, in higher education across Australia. So geoscience fits in to the natural and physical sciences uh, box. Um, these dates are slightly different. So here we're going from 2010 to 2019. Um, as opposed to 20, 2003 to 2017 for the geoscience data. But you can see over this period in the natural and physical sciences, there's actually been quite a steady increase in enrolments. And so if we compare that to the geoscience trend, um, there's, there's quite a contrast where geosciences have decreased, the rest of the natural and physical sciences have continued to increase. However, I think it's interesting that over that time, agriculture, environmental and related sciences, which um, obviously have a lot of similarities to the geosciences, have had actually a pretty similar trend with a peak in 2013 and decrease since then. So if we compare those numbers, the trend actually looks quite similar to what's going on in geoscience. So to me, that's, this makes me wonder um, if maybe there's more, it's not just the mining boom, but there are some broader societal trends um, that, are, that are controlling students' um, interest in different fields. Uh, some other things that I think are interesting, so certainly IT and health have had really strong increasing trends um, over this whole period. Um, but also interesting, management and commerce um, have very strong enrolments. So I'm not sure if you can see the numbers here, but this uh, top line is at 40,000 for management and commerce compared with 10,000 for IT and 20,000 for engineering. So they've had very strong and consistent enrolments over this whole period, suggesting that um, you know, there are a lot of students out there who do just want um, a stable, well-paid job. We can also compare enrolment trends with different countries. Um, so here I have the UK, Canada and the US. Again, these plots go over different time scales. So highlighted in the blue is the same time scale as we have for the Australian data. And in all of these countries, there were increasing trends from sort of 2003 onwards. Um, the peak in Canada and US came a little later than in Australia, but they've also seen drops um, in the last few years. And the trend in the UK is very, very similar to Australia. Again, interesting because those, um, those mining jobs are not so prevalent in the UK, although um, there's certainly a lot of um, control there from the uh, petroleum and energy industries. So all of this together just suggesting, again, I'm, I'm not coming to this with any answers, but I think they're just, it's kind of some interesting data um, that could maybe encourage us to think a bit more broadly about what it is that's, that's controlling these students' decisions. And a couple of case studies of, um, of how, where people have, uh, have taken the time to actually collect the data from the students and figure out what it is that's motivating these students um, uh, to, to be able to inform their policy. So this is an example from Utrecht University in the early 2000s. So obviously this is uh, at a different time and in a different place. So I'm not at all suggesting that their findings are the same as what we would find here. But I think the methodology that was used here can be really informative for us. So their problem was that they had low student numbers and their marketing was kind of this similar to what we would do. So the, the lecturers and the academics in the department thought about what it was that they loved about earth science. And they loved that it was just interesting, just fascinating learning about the earth. And they thought that it was very socially relevant as well. And so their marketing and outreach was based on, based on that, based on what they thought was, was important and what would have an impact on the students. Um, but what they did is they also recognised that they were experts in earth science, they weren't experts in the psychology of 17 year olds. So they commissioned experts who did know about that to develop better marketing techniques. 
And they did a lot of surveys of students to understand what were their motivations in choosing their university courses. And they found that the students' main motivation was actually career prospects. And their perception was that in earth science, there weren't very good career prospects. <clears throat> they thought the jobs were mainly in research or in oil, oil and gas, and that in oil and gas, people got laid off all the time and they weren't very good jobs. And this point in the paper I thought was, was really interesting, and I'm just going to read it out, that the findings of this survey were shocking to the department faculty. In fact, it was difficult to convince them of how far off past recruitment efforts had been in terms of getting students to be interested in careers in the earth sciences. And for this reason, the company that carried out the survey and analysis was asked to make a video compilation of relevant parts of the interviews. And the resulting video proved necessary to make the faculty members step away from their own ideas and appreciate the points of view of potential students. I thought that was really, really telling that, um, and again, you know, we're, we're all scientists, but when it, when it comes to these kind of issues and we step away from that, we become very unscientific um, and we have our own ideas that are often not based in any data and we can stick really strongly to thinking that that's got to be the solution rather than, uh, as I say, being scientific about it, collecting some data and then acting on what the data actually showed. So once, once they were convinced to do that, they changed their marketing and outreach um, to be more focused on specific information about career opportunities and expanding that um, beyond oil and gas. And I think this is certainly something we could learn as well that, um, that like in, in earth science in Australia, there are a lot of job opportunities um, beyond mining, but we tend to focus on mining a lot in our, in, in our discussions. So they, they changed to become beyond oil and gas, talk about the wide range of careers that were on offer. Um, and, and as a result, they had really impressive increases in student numbers um, and, and actually grew more in student numbers than any other um, faculty, any other degree um, at Utrecht University. Some more data from North Arizona University that I think um, some of these can be uh, informative to, um, to us. So here they have uh, they have these really large first year, really broad kind of first year subjects. So they had 783 sub students in their first year geology uh, units. But then that went to just 23 students doing a geology major. So they were wanting to understand, you know, how can we um, attract more of those 783 first years to do majors? So some interesting differences here is that um, they actually have a very large proportion of their students who had taken a geology, a geology class um, at school, so between sort of 60 and 70 percent had done so, which was sort of comparable to physics, more than environmental science, and just a bit less than chemistry or biology. Those students did not have poor perceptions of the environmental impact of geology. Only 20 percent thought that they were employed in polluting industries. And more like 50 percent thought that geologists worked at correcting global warming and pollution. Um, and something I thought was interesting that really in, in all of this analysis that they showed, the only real difference between geology and many of the other fields was the perceived prestige of department and the job. So um, here the perceived prestige of both geology and environmental science was much lower than those of physics, uh, or chemistry or biology. Um, however, more of the students thought that the job would be fulfilling than jobs in the other fields and they thought that the employability was about the same. Um, so they didn't hear, this is just sort of some data that, um, that, that not acted upon um, in the same way as the Utrecht data. But still, I think a nice example of the kind of data that it's useful to have to understand um, what it is, where, where are our students coming from, what are their backgrounds, and what are their priorities. Um, and from an Australian uh, example, a bit of inspiration for success. So this is from the surveyors who started with a problem very similar to geoscience. They had low student numbers, insufficient graduates for industry needs. 
um, and probably even more so than geoscience, that the students are just not exposed to surveying at school. Students don't know what it is. So they've had a lot of, they put a lot of work into some programs um, with an initial focus on high school students because they really needed um, a change in the numbers of graduates in a short time scale. So, so therefore, you sort of have to focus on high school students, whereas um, obviously a longer term program would also focus on um, primary school students. So they've focused a lot on training careers advisors in high schools. They have these big full day excursions with hands on experience and really showing the students how they can apply maths to surveying. Um, and they have close connections with industry, giving students work experience opportunities, which they've said um, has been really, really um, impactful. And they now have a huge database with contacts of a lot of students and teachers that they can um, keep up to date about surveying uh, events. All of their TAFE courses are now full. Their university student numbers are up. The numbers of people pursuing professional registration is up. Um, and I think really tellingly, when they survey their careers advisors, eight years ago, none of them felt confident about recommending surveying to students. Whereas now 75% of them feel confident in recognising which students surveying would work for um, and recommending surveying to them as an option. So, so it can be done. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, it's just a matter of figuring out what is the message that needs to get to those students and then doing the work to get to them. Um, and so that's um, kind of where I think that we need to go from here. I think that first step is to collect and share data about what it is that's motivating or not motivating students to, to take on geology. Um, we need estimates of industry needs, just those numerical estimates even of how many graduates industry actually needs um, is a really vital starting point. Um, and for those of us who work in universities or at schools, um, I think we can start out with some very uh, some easy information to find out um, by doing some pretty low energy um, surveying of our students. Things like asking them how many of our first year students um, studied earth and environmental science at high school, understanding the reasons for their first year subject choices, looking at the retention rates from different styles of units, keeping in touch with our graduates um, and so that we can showcase the types of graduate jobs that are possible to, to incoming students. And for those of us doing outreach, um, having an analysis of what programs are effective, building into our outreach strategy some assessment of whether the program is effective um, and, and then figuring out if, if a program is not effective, even if we love it, then there's no reason to continue it. Um, and that's going to help us know what are those things that are actually motivating those students. I really feel like in Australia at the moment we need, we really, as, as Rachel was saying, we need a coordin coordinated approach to this. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly more than happy to begin um, compiling these kinds of data. If you have anything out there, uh, please feel free to send them along to me. Um, but we can begin this process of, of getting this together. Thanks very much. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much to all three presenters today. I think there's been a great amount of comment and question and chat online. We're very tight for time and I do want to say firstly also thank you Kate for being patient through our technical challenges there. Um, it, it worked great in the end so well done. Um, I might start with a question that actually incorporates a couple of points that um, not exactly the same questions as Richard and Keith but it touches on it a bit and um, one of the comments that has been made here has been around you know, the emphasis on mining and, and then I think by extension, the emphasis on geology. I just want to make a comment about how perhaps Kate in particular sees the definition of geoscience is also being really pivotal, pivotal here. Uh, and, and what I'm really getting at is you use the surveyors as an example, but to many of us here at Geoscience Australia, we would consider the surveyors to be an integral part of geoscience. 
So, you know, could it be that we're perhaps struggling with the definition of geoscience when we're looking at these problems? Uh, and perhaps there could be some sense in pulling it into a more holistic geoscience approach. Any comments there? Yeah, I mean, I agree totally, Steve. And I think certainly in, in that step of encouraging a late high school student to take up an earth science, geoscience degree at university, I, th I think in that sense, um, having a really broad definition, it can only be useful to us because different people are going to be interested in different things. Um, and, you know, some of those students do want to wear a hard hat and stand next to a mine. Some of those students want to collect river samples. Some of those students want to sit in front of some amazing remote sensing imagery. Encouraging all of those students to come into a geoscience degree. And then once they get into that degree, they can see all of those different options and then specialise into whichever one they actually want to go into. Um, yeah, I think, I think that expanding that definition um, can only be useful. And, is, and as you say, is more is more accurate as well because all of those all of those fields are part of geoscience and our geoscience graduates do go into such a huge variety of jobs. Excellent. Thanks for that. Um, I am conscious of time. We've got about a minute left. A quick one for um, perhaps Rachel, maybe Shona from Kaya, just about does Geoscience Australia have a work experience program? Okay, thanks Kaya for that one. <laughs> um, we have an established volunteer program, which is great for anybody over the age of 18. Um, we do have a work experience and a student program, but it's not well articulated in my understanding that it is being revisited. Um, it is very much done on an ad hoc basis, um, kind of who you know here. If you can get somebody to supervise you, then things happen. Um, and so there's quite a few of us, I think, that would like to see a more strategic process-oriented um, approach to the work experience program. But right now, the best way in, in the door for that kind of thing is, unfortunately, for when you're over 18, you can come join the volunteer program. Terrific. Thank you. I know that as chair, my job is really to keep us to time. Um, there are some, I do draw particularly the speaker's attention to some of the great questions and comments from people like um, Eamon and also Mike Smith has a question there about the time warp. Um, if, if perhaps we could follow up with them out of uh, session. Um, once again, I'd like to thank our speakers today for an excellent talk. In the short time available, I also want to urge everyone to keep their eyes out for our future talks as part of our Wednesday seminar uh, series at Geoscience Australia. We do have a distinguished Geoscience Australia lecturer presentation coming up on the 10th of March from Bill for Marcus talking about um, embracing automation, digital culture and the cloud and um, how, what that has meant particularly for us at Geoscience Australia. And I think that should be really interesting. Bill always has good stuff to talk about. So um, please, keep engaged there. But um, thank you everyone for coming along.